right. <laughs> We're still waiting on uh, Ryan Petty to show up. He's uh, supposed to be here in a few minutes. I'll give him a couple of seconds. I figured I would vamp for a minute because I like talking to you all. I have my reading glasses on because during the middle of the day when the sun is beaming through the tent, you know, I'm in a tent. When the sun beams through the tent, it kind of creates this yellow filter. It makes it really hard for me to see in my glasses and see the screen. So I have the screen turned all the way up. And uh, it's just kind of funny, these things you have to figure out as you uh, get everything going on your uh, your show to make a show look legit. And then I just here comes Ryan Petty. Hey, Ryan, how are you? Hey, good afternoon. Do me a favor. Start us off by saying, hey, this is Ryan Petty, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. Hi, this is Ryan Petty, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. Ryan's an interesting dude. He has a, uh, a background we're going to get into and talk a little bit about some of his work um, on the uh, awareness side. But but let's start off. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is uh, you wrote this fantastic blog about what President Trump did accomplish in his four years. And, and when you do these kind of postmortems, and we're assuming that President Trump's done here, but um, when you do these postmortems, you get a chance to start to say, okay, did this work? And I've been thinking about a concept of like an ELO rating for politicians, right? Like um, in chess, you have an ELO, you know, a rating to say, look, this is where you're at. Oh, you're a grandmaster. Because right now, yeah. really, it's it's sort of just all it's just sort of just all bullshit. You know, like I'm a really good legislator. Are you? Because I can't tell. <laughs> we never go back in time and say this person on the average makes good decisions or, yeah. you know, man, they're a collaborator. And so I, I want to just kind of, because it's too hard to do now, even like president Obama, his, his presidency is evolving. President Bush's presidency seems to be ascending in terms of, he was at the very bottom. And when he, right. when he got done, right. Truman has gone from the very bottom to damn near the top in the last 70 years. So let's talk a little bit about assessing a presidency in general. And then let's talk specifically about Donald Trump. Well, you know, it's an interesting thought. Um, I guess the the challenge is always, you know, who's measuring, what context are you using, and and how much does your own do your own personal biases uh, creep into that uh, that uh, score or that rating? Mm -hmm. So, for example, when you like something President Trump did or President Obama did, do they get bonus points because you like the policy that they pushed forward? Um, but it's, it would be interesting to sort of measure against what they promised, what was promised during the campaign versus what was actually accomplished. Mm. Um, that might be an interesting measurement because a lot of what gets promised in, during the campaign are, are simply things that many politicians, especially presidents, can't actually accomplish. <laughs> so I think a lot of us understand that going into it, but, mm. you know, too much of the population, I think, believes the president can completely control the, the economy or can stop things like viruses, you know, if they just yeah. do, if they just follow their preferred policy prescriptions. And that's really, uh, really kind of a fantasy land, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. You know, we, we put a lot of blame on President Trump. And, and again, look, I mean, the dude caught, I've determined, Pete has determined in my ELO rating for President Trump is that uh, he he's, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. The crazy that comes with President Trump, whether it's his own crazy or other people's reaction to his crazy, uh, it's not worth it. And let's also add in the unforced errors. Uh, you know what? I know quite a bit about presidential history. He is the most unforced error committing president. Like he will purposely hit the ball into the net. He's a tennis, a tennis example. And so it, it becomes hard to like keep your rating up when you on purpose drive most of the nation crazy. And, and that takes out all the other stuff. So when you look at these policy and examine these things, there has to be like a social score of some kind too. Like, were you able to, and I just, I'm getting all the way back to the president thing. You know, like my example I've been using is, Senator Warren said, if I'm elected president, I'm going to have, I'm going to cut in half veteran suicide. Like, what the F are you waiting for? Do it now, Senator. You're the legislator. You have the checkbook. Do it now. The president is a king, and yet they seem to run like they're trying to become king. Yeah. You know, um, it, it comes back to a thought. You mentioned the, the unforced errors. Um, you know, I, I read a, an article this past week um, from Hunter Baker 
uh, who made some compelling arguments about the unforced errors or what what you're describing as unforced errors. That's really, um, un unfortunately, I mean, I, I got to see a side of President Trump that many don't get to see. I, I sat with him personally on three occasions to push through some school safety uh, work that that uh, that I was doing that we can certainly get into into more detail. And I, I saw him be very empathetic with a group of victims' families um, that's far different than what you see him portrayed in the media. But on that point specifically, the daily sparring with the media, I yeah. think it was effective in getting him elected. But a lot of presidents have trouble moving from that campaign to get a, that campaign mode into governing mode. And I think what what a lot of Americans wanted to see was President Trump transition into that governing mode and stop the daily sparring with the press. He had un, the unprecedented ability, I think, to reach out to the American public in a way that, you know, we, we hearken back to Ronald Reagan. Uh, reaching out over the press uh, several times to have a conversation with the American people. And he was quite limited in the technology of the day, right? Right. He had, he had TV, radio, and a couple of things. President Trump had, you know, what, 80 million followers on Twitter, social media, uh, yeah. an army of folks to amplify his voice. He had no trouble getting his message directly out to the American people. Yet I think he kept fighting this battle with the media that in many ways was unnecessary because he had the ability to communicate. He didn't need to convince them to, to promote his message, if you will. And so the battles become, you know, uh, maybe too encompassing and, and the narrative changes and your effectiveness, um, you know, then, then you start to wonder, well, was he, is he really being effective or is he spending all of his time thinking about how to respond to the latest Chiron on CNN, right? So look, I think, I think what, and I think we saw this in the suburbs, right? Particularly, I think with white female suburban women voters, right? Who didn't like the style. I, they, I think they understood it at the beginning. Hey, this new guy's coming in. He's combative. Uh, he's not going to uh, fold like some previous Republican candidates and, and, and people liked that and they responded to that. Uh, but then I think they wanted to see him shift gears and govern and and talk directly to them. The uh, one of the things that's maddening about Donald Trump is, well, there's a lot of things, <laughs> quite honestly. But he would take things like uh, he ran one of his planks this time was term limits. I'm going to work on term limits, and that should get a lot of people's attention. It did not because he didn't do a good job of talking about it. Every time Joe Biden, and I'm no Joe Biden fan, I actually am, am you know, pretty disappointed that, that was the best that the, the Democrats had to offer. And that's why I'm critical of the Democrats. Like you had all this time to put somebody together that that would be at least, how about, when will we break the string of people who aren't, like, like who are felons running for president? Like we got to get away from these folks that are just entirely compromised in terms of character. Anyhow, let well, me get back on my point. Well, there's a case, though, Pete, of a party that was completely maniacally focused on being every anti-Trump. That's all they yeah. that's all they did for four years. Yeah. And yeah. so rather than do the soul searching that you're that you're suggesting and really come up with a great candidate that could have beat that could beat Donald Trump and beat the Republicans, yeah. they just focused on beating up Donald Trump. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which which is to all of our detriment. But like the whole thing when he would talk about uh, COVID, you know, Joe Biden would say the same thing over and over again. Why didn't Donald Trump say like on this date you were still talking about COVID not being a real thing? That exponentially increases the number of deaths, Joe. And now you're talking about wearing a mask. Where you been? You know. And instead, he just kind of he said the same things he always said. Yeah, you know, I don't want to get into this Donald Trump nonsense back and forth thing. What I really want to talk about is an analyzing presidency, right? So when we look at someone like um, President Obama, you know, he spends a lot of his political capital up front. He has these super majorities. He can do a lot, but largely doesn't get a lot done and then gets hemmed up the next six years once the Republicans take back some, some of the legislative control. So how do you assess that? How do you look at a list? Like, is it is timing? Timing is so important to a president. And like, what's even possible? So maybe that is part of the problem with an ELO rating. 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, it goes back to them making promises that they can't keep. And and you made the comment about them running to be king, you know, it's, yeah. you know, I, th you know I think we expect too much of our, of our presidents. We, we think they have uh, the ability to control the economy, mm -hmm. our lives, um, uh, m m many facets of our lives. And in reality, the, the president's beholden uh, in large part to the whims of the legislature, certainly when it comes to spending money. I've seen, you know, I, I saw uh, a case which I can get into or an example where President Trump uh, worked very hard with four departments in the executive branch to overcome some concerns or his inability to move things through the legislature. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he had he made some progress, but I worry that that gets quickly undone. I mean, a lot of what Obama did was undone by President Trump. A lot That's of right. what President Trump is doing now or has done now will likely be uh, undone. And, and even though the Democratic Party was so focused on orange man bad, there are folks there uh, within the civil ser service groups that were certainly keeping score. Here's what we changed under Trump, you know, and, and those, those changes will likely be undone very quickly uh, in an Obi in a, in a oh, Biden, in a Biden Harris administration. Yeah. This, uh, this desire to lean on executive orders, you know, some of these things hold up, but, but it is, it is a very, uh, it, you, you know, your administrations will careen from side to side, and it does not do well for all of us. Like as a veteran, I'm worried that a, an improved VA will now go back because somehow that will be bad policy right. to improve the VA. And I think that's a valid, valid concern. And if Absolutely. that's true for the veterans community, gosh, who isn't it true for, you know, uh, the pro-business stance that President Trump took, the ability to create, I mean, how remarkable is this? If if he ran and said, I will make us energy independent, matter of fact, we'll be net exporters of energy, sign me up. I want to understand how we're going to do that and turn that into an advantage. I'm going to go approach um, the Arab countries who are aligned against Israel, and I'm going to start picking them off ones at a time, getting them to normalize relations. Yes, please. You know, all of these things that are incredible. <sighs> But we can't give it to him because we hate the guy so much as a nation. Right, right, right. And 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 this goes to you know on on. Let me talk for a moment on school safety because this is an area yeah. where I worked very closely with the with the administration. So, several trips to to D.C. after the tragedy in Parkland. And I guess for the viewers of your show that don't know, um, I'm the father of one of the victims in Parkland. Uh, Elena Petty was my daughter. She was killed on February 14, 2018, and subsequent to that, um, I've been working with both state and federal legislatures and executive branches uh, to try to reform public school safety. So I've worked very hard in, in that area. We made some initial quick progress, but that was in large part due to just the emotions that were in play after, after the tragedy. That progress tends to slow down the further you get away from a tragedy. And it's something that's, um, you know, knowing many of the Columbine families and the um, the Sandy Hook families, I've seen this uh, happen with them and they've, they've warned me or told me that this is likely uh, to occur. The, the issue um, though with President Trump and on the executive orders, um, so we sat in um, the Roosevelt Room with President Trump and four department heads. Um, and there was a, the idea was brought forward to put together what we were calling a school safety clearinghouse. It's what eventually became um, schoolsafety.gov, which was really kind of an unprecedented uh, collaboration between Department of Homeland Security, Department of Education, Health and Human Services, and the DOJ. Each of those departments had their own school safety silo and silos of educate uh, silos of information. And I sat in a meeting where President Trump looked at the four heads of those departments and and said, "We need to bring this all together. This is a good idea. Let's do it." And there was an objection that was presented, and I, it was a lower level. It wasn't a cabinet head, but it was one of the lower level folks, and and it was around budgeting, right? Because the funding for those departments comes from Congress. And they're funded separately for their own missions. And 
they're not really allowed to share money across uh, departments without authorization from Congress. So Trump said, look, I don't care how you do it. Just get it done. And uh, I saw the department's head look, look at him and say, yes, Mr. President, we'll find a way to get this done. And they did. And they did. So DHS houses schoolsafety.gov and the other three departments contribute information to it. But the funding all comes from DHS. And th that's a fantastic example, I think, of, of something that uh, a problem that President Trump solved, like in real time, sitting there, bringing in his business experience and not really following the Washington way of doing things. Um, but a Biden administration could come in and say, you know what, we don't like schoolsafety.gov. It doesn't have enough gun control, uh, which is likely to happen, right? Doesn't It doesn't have our prescribed policy initiatives. And so we're going to either turn it off, undo it, or radically change it uh, in a way that um, – uh, that that they that they see fit, and so that that's the challenge with, you know, that was a a good thing that President Trump did on the executive side, but it's also fraught with uh, with danger because it can it can be quickly undone, or or re repoliticized or something. Sure. Yeah, sure. It, it's a great point, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the the school safety thing because I do want to have this conversation, and hopefully we can put it on pause for a minute because I kind of still want to get into this presidential accomplishment thing. But you're right. You're describing the President Trump, the part of President Trump that I like, you know, the guy that's like, hey, uh, OK, diplomatic relations don't work. Jared, go find another path. See if these guys will do business together or whatever right. it is. Right. And right. then Jared Kushner goes out and I'll be damned. You know, he gets the Serbs and the Kosovars to go, oh, we hate each other. We're not going to get along diplomatically, but okay on travel okay. or you know and hey you got your foot in the door you know passing something on to the next guy joe biden terrible foreign policy but that aside uh he's got a chance to maybe get his shoulder nudged in there you know like it's something i mean south korea and north korea is a big problem and every president in, in heck my parents lifetimes and my lifetime has done a terrible job uh at getting north korea to do anything that we all recognize as positive and I'll be damned. There's president Trump saying, let's try something else. So that really is his, to his benefit, you know, these things, do they have a legacy though? Like, does this stuff last? Do you think? You know, it's, uh, it, it, it it's interesting. Um, I, I don't know because, um, I think when, when I look at the the what, what's happened in the Middle East, I, I think there's probably some benefit to that. Look, Donald Trump's a business guy at heart, right? And I think he believes there's a deal to be made, right, in all of these uh, situations. And so if he could just bring folks together, probably driven a lot by their economic uh, motivations and 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 finding something economically that ties these. Uh, peoples together in a way that perhaps religion or policy or geography don't or or do as the case may be in the Middle East where the geographies are so tight I, I think he f I think he believes there's something there economically that he can bring those those parties together and that they can get above their differences over religion policy whatever his history in many cases and and move forward at least economically together. And so again, I I, I don't want to mischaracterize those deals because uh, I don't know that they were 100 percent or even 80 percent economically driven. But there, I I think it's that deal making in Donald Trump that says let's try this a different way, and a belief and a confidence born out of probably a lot of success and as we know a lot of failures in deal making that it's okay to try something new. And so it's 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 nice to see somebody try something different rather than just relying on the folks that have been doing it for you know years and years and years who say ah, it can't be done. So let's not even try. Your list in your blog, and I'll put that link up here in a second. Here, um, it's on uh, right there on the screen. You can go there, and it's the it's the first thing on there. But it, it's a hundred and twenty some odd. Let me see, one hundred and twenty eight things long and it's already out of date and it's already a long list. Sure. 
Sure. It needs it's to be updated. It's incredible when you think about that. Like, and what are the, like, and I'm, I, mean, I think everybody's heard it. Like, I'm critical of President Trump. He has wasted an opportunity, although second terms are no, notoriously horrible. So maybe we, we all got lucky here. But yeah. Um, 128 things that you can say this guy did, and it's fine to say he didn't do anything good and all that. Yet, let's be reasonable about this and say it's 128 things. You didn't list things that were terrible. You listed things like good, like the the schoolsafety.gov decision, uh, the Abraham Accords, which got better since your list. Is 128 that? I, I don't have context though. Is that a good number? Do you think, or does that seem like yeah, 50 50? Well, you know, in, in, in full disclosure, so this is a list I saw floating around on the internet, right? And I decided to take a look at it. And I was, I had the same reaction you did, which is I, I tend to like President Trump, at least I liked what he did while he was in office. And so I looked at it and I said, wow, this is a pretty expansive list of things. And a right. lot of them, I was surprised about how many I didn't know. And I thought I was, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure I've been accused of being part of MAGA Nation, right? So I, I should have known these things. And I was surprised by how many I didn't know. That was the first first thing. So this is a list that was put together, as I understand it, by a retired uh, captain in the Navy or Air Force, if I if I'm if memory's serving. And I and I I said, you know, this is a good list. Let me clean it up a little bit and add a few things that I know personally and and update it with like the Abraham Accords, et cetera, et cetera. So I posted this thing. Uh, I put it on Twitter. I put it on Facebook. And, and, you know, those are typically places where you get a lot of pushback and a lot, you know, a lot of armchair quarterbacking and things like that. And I was, I was surprised by the response from both my, my, my Trump supporting friends and my non-Trump supporting friends. The non-Trump supporting friends were probably the most surprised to see this list. They had no idea he had done any of these things. And quite frankly, when they looked at the list and read through it, the response or the reaction was quite positive. Like, wow, yeah. I actually agree with a lot of these things. So <laughs> again, could could more energy have been spent by the Trump administration in promoting the things that they were doing behind the scenes, like this list of 128 yeah. things, like getting that message out to the American people versus fighting or sparring with yeah. the White House press corps? Um, I think there's an argument to be made there. I, I, there's absolutely an argument to be made there. I mean, there are so many things where if, if president Trump is a racist, which is one of the standard tropes that they say about him, which kind of gives you a clue as to how I feel about that. He is the worst racist ever. You right. know, the, the historically black colleges and universities, not even six months ago, he's like, wait, what do you mean that they're struggling with funding? Get them down here. I get a magic pen and I'm going to sign this thing. And we're going to get these guys some money. Nobody covered it. You know, <laughs> Just nobody. No. He said, we, there's a legal problem federally. There's loopholes where human trafficking is really hitting the American Indian community hard. Close those loopholes. I mean, that's an executive that is doing something that, if he's a racist, those are contrary to what he should be doing. And he's absolutely. And then the thing is, I would take these things, right? And I would say, clearly, this is a good thing. 100%. Um, you know, uh, forgiveness for veterans who are 100% service connected to their disability. We're going to forgive all of their educational debt. I put that up, but surely we can all agree on this. No, we could not. No, we could not agree that the Indian uh, changes to the laws to create task forces and apply money. Again, with one of these things, how does this money work? He was cutting through the red tape on these things. Not a good idea. It was pandering. And so <laughs> you have these things, you're like, if you look at this list, you have you're struck with just how much is there. But again, like, do you feel like this is a list that has a lot of action, or is that what you should expect from a president for four years? I, you know, I again, I was surprised as anyone by the list and the and the number of uh, accomplishments. Um, no, I think we should expect this from our leaders. I mean, I think we we hire them, so to speak, to come in and 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 do things differently. I think that's the expectation. I think what right. typically happens is they come in and they have the experience that I related a, a moment ago where some low level official uh, in, in, in a Roosevelt room with the president there tells him he can't do something. And too often, I think presidents listen to that. Uh, and maybe department heads, maybe it goes down into the leadership. They just, they accept that. 
because, well, that yeah. guy's an expert because he's been in the foreign service for the past 30 years and he just knows that they'll never do a deal with Israel, right? Yeah. Or, or there's no way that these four departments could work together to create schoolsafety.gov because their funding separate and Congress would never allow them to do that. Well, figure it out, right? And so that's what I, I would hope that we would, we would hire, vote into office leaders that are not afraid to question what's going on and to do the right thing. In the case of, of veterans and forgiving the debt, there's probably a list of 20 reasons why that's not a good idea that some right. bureaucrat in DC, part of the swamp, right? As President Trump would call them, would say that, no, we can't do that. Or there's a, there's a list of things we should do before we get to that. Right. And, and I think, uh, what I what I appreciated about President Trump's approach is just coming in and saying, "What's the right thing to do here?" Okay, debate's over. Go do it. Yeah. Go go yeah. do that thing. I remember a bunch of the service members I was working with in Iraq. Uh, their boots were just getting worn out. You know, they had deployed. They had a set of boots. They brought them. You know, and they just were worn out. And we were having trouble getting boots. And so someone brings that to the boss's attention. It's a battalion commander. And he looks at his four, the person who handles supply, and goes, that's fixed, right? And he's like, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Just it, it was a presumptive close. He's like, that's not going to be a problem anymore. You know, he didn't say, hey, Mike, I need you to look. He's like, fix that. And that, yeah. that's a, a thing that we don't, I think, often get from politicians. They, they are hemmed up. Uh, you see these things a lot. Uh, there, there was a thing called a radio in a box. It's like a radio station in a box. It's just a big, you know, like a Pelican case, you know, you can physically pick it up and carry it around. And these things cost, I don't know, hundred, hundred thousand bucks. Right. And it's a powerful tool for a local governor in a foreign place to be able to communicate with their people, which is not something that they can commonly do. It's all done by word of mouth, maybe by phone. And here's the ability to mass communicate. And so we were studying this and we're like, Hey, this thing works. This thing, give more control to the governor. Like, Ooh, what if, what if the governor says things that are, you know, pro Taliban or, or, or pro Al Qaeda? Like, yeah, I don't care. They're the governor, let them govern the way they need to, you know, and then shut up. And then they're like, yeah, but they can't keep them because that's, I don't know, title 10 funds or something like that. And I look at the commander and be like, we, this takes a hundred thousand dollars on top of that building over there. There are 50 antennas for pieces of equipment that have just disappeared. No one gives a fuck about that. Like, just who cares? The thing disappears, it disappears, and at least his governor has this tool. But you're right, that one person who's like, oh, no, sure, oh, that's magic money. We can't spend that much. Like, I don't care how much it costs. Give the guy the tool to be able to do the job, you know? Well, it, it, it seems to me that we were able to make decisions like that, um, in you know, in previous conflicts, a little bit faster. I I know I I'd heard about the the example of the uh, the need for better armor around the Humvee vehicles and some of the other vehicles. And I know, and and, and I don't know the specifics because I, I I I was not there, but I I know I read the news reports, and it seemed to me we we needed to study the problem a little bit more before we made a decision. It sounds very similar to the radio example. It feels like most politicians. So, so here's, you know, here's one of the things I've, I, I've learned in my, my day job, which is technology. One of the companies I admire is Amazon. Now, there's a whole lot of reasons why you might not admire Amazon, but one of the things that they do, one of their leadership principles is they're biased to, to, bias to action. They have a bias yeah. for action, which means they're about making decisions. And so we don't have a meeting to study problems. We have a meeting to gather all the facts as best we know them at the current time and we make a decision and and we understand whether that's a i guess what is called like a door closing decision mm -hmm. or a decision where the door isn't closed behind us so we can adjust we can make a different decision in the future we can turn a little bit to the left we can turn a little bit to the right if we need to but the bias for action is what's needed and i think um you know not getting into how much action we want the government to actually you know to actually yeah. take but so yeah. much of so much of the bureaucracy i think in dc in my experience is just um trying to you know push rope through the process as it were is that 
I can't make I can't make this decision on my own without a study or some research or knowing that I've got six or seven colleagues in the Senate that will co-sign a piece of you know piece of yeah. legislation for me. I can't do the right thing unless I have a study saying I'm doing the right thing. So um, I, I I don't know. I I kind of like uh, I kind of like the 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 commander you mentioned. You know, let's make a decision. Let's do the right thing. Yeah. And if we need to adjust down the road, we'll adjust down the road. We'll make a yeah. new decision, but let's, let's go, let's go forward with what we know what is right. Yeah. And then if you have an expert in the room and they're like, Hey, uh, don't give me a legislative reason why you can't do this. Like, Oh, by the way, like if we're going to do this radio thing, let's make sure we're listening. You know, like one of the reasons why I was able to win with commanders a lot with the radio is I would take all the previous units slide decks about radio programs. And I'd be like, I don't care what we do. Let's just, not follow this pattern because they would all like, I know what to do. Let's get the radio to the people. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> you know, and then they would brief on the capability of the radio, like it broadcasts in this big circle. And I'm like, yeah, but I went out and there's, there's, it's not doing that. And then we went out and we found the guy who used to have the radio and he's like, yeah, someone stole that thing years ago. So literally this other commander is being briefed every day, like commander radios do this, you know, they're broadcasting in the circle. I raise my hand. I'm like, are we, I always say, are we allowed to actually talk in this meeting? And they're like, yes, of course, of course. What do you want to say? I'm like, that radio doesn't exist. It's not there. There's nothing being broadcast. And then you try to warn that officer in advance who's going to brief it. There's a radio there and they laugh at you, <laughs> you know? So we have these ground truth people that we have to have in these decision processes so that the commander can then make a better decision, but it can't always be limiting. You're right. Like this, I'm not saying break the law, but some things need to need to go. And that, that iterative process of, of pushing through something, you know, even if we start by screwing it up, you know, we, we get better and better at it. It's uh. Anyhow, I, I definitely think that was a, a trait and a failing of Donald Trump because that's how those things work, where you act, you act, you act, and then it's like you're in this different space than when you were originally. And sometimes when you're impulsive, it's bad, but when you're intuitive, it's good, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, during that, uh, during one of the meetings we had with President Trump, he made he made the decision to put SchoolSafety.gov together, and we were having a follow on conversation with him where we were, where um, we were reviewing the results. Here, here it is. Here's what it looks like. Um, and we had we had a good meeting. Focus of the meeting was school safety. The press was in the room with us, um, and the first question was about his tax returns. I think that's that was the news of the day, right? And so it wasn't about what we talked about in the meeting. It wasn't about, and I know he he, he leaned over to one of the other dads and he said, "Do you see what I have to deal with every day?" Yeah. The 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 point though is, I think at. What what I would, I understand the frustration, but what I what I was hoping he would do is is either say, look, I'll take questions about school safety, mm -hmm. um, and any other questions you have, please refer them to the press secretary, right? Um, or if you're not going to ask me any questions about school safety, then I'm going to do my own. I'm going to hold a press conference. I'm going to do my own. I'm going to do my own thing, or I'm going to go on Twitter and talk about this, or whatever the whatever mm -hmm. the case was. Yeah. So. You know, it goes back to the point I was making earlier. I think, I think the the um, what I what what I would have liked to have seen is more direct interaction with uh, with the American people because I think if they had seen this list, if he had gotten on every day and said, you know, day thirteen, I signed the biggest wilderness protection and conservation bill in a decade, designated three hundred seventy five thousand acres as protected land, yeah. I think all sides would have went okay. I wasn't. Really? Yeah. I didn't realize that. Didn't know he did that. I actually like yeah. that. Or I spent $10 million on the Save Our Seas Act. Okay, I like that, you know. Yeah. But but it was it was more about fighting with the press, I think, in many days. Yeah. And again, this is where I, you know, I want to be critical of, of my peers in the media. I would watch the White House press briefings because I didn't want to hear someone else tell me what, what was said. I wanted to hear it. And it was often this thing, like here was this incredible piece of work we've done. And then the press corps in general, and I know not everybody follows into this thing, but they would let all of us down by doing that, by making it about them, by by challenging the president on something like, no, this is important. We've all thought that school safety is important. And, and I want to really get into this part of the conversation now. Yeah. When, when you talk to your, your it's, a, it's horrible to lose a kid in these kind of things. 
but you're the ones that are going to guide us through this stuff. So when you talk to your peers that were there before, who've done this through several administrations, what was their opinion in terms of how are we doing? Like, what are the presidents and the legislatures, you know, when is it working? When is it not? You know, um, I, I was able to ask that question after I had a really re emotional response, not only to the tragedy, but, but beyond, beyond the loss of, uh, of my daughter, which was, which was um, devastating. And for weeks I was just numb. When I woke up from being numb, <laughs> Um, I was angry uh -huh. and, and, and I've talked to, uh, particularly I've got some great friends that, um, that lost children in the Sandy hook tragedy. So I say this very carefully, but I was angry. I was angry with all the previous families of the victims in a way that is to say, why didn't you, why didn't you change this? Why yeah. didn't you prevent this from happening to me and to my family? And then I realized that, um, they had tried. They tried very hard. And some of them have done some amazing work that, that I sit in, in awe of, of the work that they've done. But let me, let me say that the, the reason I don't think we've made as much progress is, is the tragedies up until Parkland and including Parkland in a large, to a large extent. And I'll try to talk why I think Parkland's a little different. The focus was gun control. It was the it was the weapon that was used. It was the 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 violence that was uh, perpetrated by that by that individual with that weapon that that shocked the 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 country in each case, and the focus became the firearm and what can we do to prevent these um, these these guns from being so pervasive in society. So the solution is how do we get rid of the guns? That, that, that becomes then the prescription, the policy initiatives, the, right. the conversation gets focused on that. And it, and it started that way in Parkland too. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what made me angry. Cause I said, no, not this time. We, yeah. We're going to try to make a difference this time. But if we get, if we devolve a hundred percent into simply a gun control debate. Half the country's going to tune out and not focus on this, and the other half's going to fight a battle against the Second Amendment, and and it's just going to divide us, and we're not going to get anything done. And what did I, you know, when I when I opened my eyes and cleared the, you know, cleared the tears, I saw us going down that path again, and I said, no, it's got to be different this time. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing that. I mean, because because you're right, and that also it undermines the planner's advantage. You know, like we're, if you chase the means, the vector, you can't stop it. You'll never stop it because that person doesn't care about legal consequences. They don't care about their life. You know, they're not capable of care. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It, it can it can be anything. It, it's, uh, uh, I'm glad that you're doing that because it, it can't be a political fight. This has got to be a fight for our kids. And how are we going to to do this better? Do you have a sense for which presidencies have done better than others in terms of, well, I mean, it goes from yeah. Bush, Obama, Trump, and well, now Biden, we, know, we don't know what's happening with him yet, but the last three presidents have had to deal with this issue. Who who has done well with this? Well, I, I think President Trump, uh, in my, my opinion, mm -hmm. President Trump has done more to try to prevent these from happening than any other president because he took a comprehensive look at it. Mm. Um, there was a lot of um, disagreement about what the approach should be. One side of the uh, one side of the debate is all about firearms, right? And right. restrict restricting the use and access to firearms. The other side of the debate is saying, look, there are there are disciplinary challenges within our schools. There are mental health issues in our schools uh, and in our society. And there are, uh, our schools are just too easy to access, uh, as an example. It's just too easy to attack a school. Mm -hmm. So what do you do about those other things? And that was really this Federal School Safety Commission looked at, in, in my view, a comprehensive look at school safety, which included all of that. And the, the, the changes that we've made, for example, in Florida, have more to do with improving um, access to mental health uh, for students, um, securing the campus, um, 
and 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 better policies and training the fidelity of the training that goes along with the policies to prevent these kinds of tragedies from happening again i feel i don't I, you look florida as you know i hold florida up as an example and i hope this never ha happens in, in in florida or anywhere i think we've done a very good job in florida that doesn't mean we're 100 percent immune but it will be much more difficult to attack a school in Florida because we took that comprehensive um, approach. And that was the approach the Trump administration took also. So I give President Trump a lot of credit for having a different conversation about school safety and accomplishing the things that we can all agree on and not focusing on the fight. And this is, you know, ironically, it's a this is the approach that had he taken, I think, maybe in his administration more broadly, not focusing on the divisive issue, but focusing on the things that we all agree on. Right. Uh, he might be he might be serving a second term. And uh, uh, so he's done. He did. A, he did a very, very good job. I think President Obama focused entirely uh, on on firearms and then put some policies in place, which I'm happy to to talk through that we changed in the Trump administration that really made it difficult for schools to deal with troubled kids, kids that have disciplinary and behavioral issues that put other students at risk. That was started in the Obama administration. And of course, President Trump, I think, or, I'm sorry, President Bush, um, I think for the most part, uh, because it was gonna be a gun control debate, he sort of disengaged from the whole thing and there wasn't a whole lot done uh, to my understanding uh, during the Bush administration. So Bush didn't do much. Obama did the wrong things. President Trump did, I, I think, the best job of the three. I mean, there is a common thread in all these things. Yes, a weapon of some kind, but that's not even universal because there's been hunting rifles, you know, pipe bombs, improvised bomb. A lot of different things have been used, but the kids who are doing this seem to have some kind of mental incapacity and often have presented something ahead of time indicating that there could be trouble. Uh, it seems like one of the things, and by the way, th this is how small this world is. You're not the only parent I know from Parkland who had, you know, who had kids there that day. I mean, this this impacts us a lot. I went to a school that had a school shooting my senior year. A, a, a graduated student walked onto campus and murdered his girlfriend in front of all her friends. So, so these things happen, and you know, who knows if we could have stopped any one of these things. But that that uh, see something, say something kind of idea what the kids have, you know, where like the crazy text comes out and it shuts the whole school down. It might be an overreaction, but it might also be the thing that limits that behavior for that kid. And you are right. There is a lot of, of mental, mentally challenged kids, whether it's hormonal or something wrong with their wiring. And, and in public schools, it is extremely difficult to to deal with them in a way other than just saying, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna just keep this kid around because, you know, parents sue unified unified school districts all the time because their kid was treated differently or whatever it is. It's hard when you got kids that are sick and need help and, and can't get it and can't be identified as easily. Yeah, I think one of the problems with the the approach uh, I think the Obama administration took, and I think in general, uh, this was inertia maybe that predates his administration, but. But in reality, what, what happens is we lump kids with behavioral uh, issues in with students with special needs that, that have special needs for other, uh, uh, you know, physical or other okay. mental disabilities, right? But we lump them all together and that makes them, that puts them in a protected class, which makes them very difficult for the school to deal with. And so in, in the case of the Parkland uh, shooter, uh, here's a kid who had, who had attacked students as early as kindergarten he'd been a he'd been a problem all the way through his k through 12 educational experience and the district fumbled the ball in many cases um yeah. we learned uh through uh through our work on the marjorie stoneman douglas public safety commission they but but in some ways they because of uh, federal requirements or fear of lawsuits um, they were ineffective in dealing with him because he, they couldn't in some, in some cases may not have been able to deal with the threat. Um, we saw the, the sheriff's department fumble tips that were, you know, they had visited the house 41 times, you know, mom was, mom was an enabler, 
mom didn't want to deal with the problem. So when the when law enforcement came and he had done some things that that it, it's clear that law enforcement should have taken some action. He should have had a juvenile record. He should have he should have um, uh, um, and and would that have precluded him from buying a firearm later on? It, it's hard to say, but they didn't deal with it. And mom mom told him not to right. The point in all of this is there are warning signs. You mentioned this. And in every single case, the more I've learned and studied these, the, I spent some t spent quite a bit of time with the U.S. Secret Service, who also studies um, mass attacks or public space attacks like schools. The warning signs are there. The ability to prevent these attacks from happening by identifying the students that are in distress and getting them the help they need before, the, before they um, evolve to violence is how we stop these things. And we finally, after Parkland, are having that conversation. That should have happened after Sandy Hook. It didn't. It, the focus was on firearms yeah. um, and firearms restrictions. And I'm hopeful now that we're, we're starting to talk about what prevention looks like. And there's a whole category here called behavioral threat assessment. It's what the Secret Service does. I, you know, interestingly, it's what the Secret Service does to protect the president, the vice yeah. president, and their families. Right. They, they're counter. They have what they call countermeasures. Those are the physical measures they take to pr protect the president. Now, there's probably rocket launchers and all, you know, armed security and all that stuff that sits at yeah. the White House. But as important, if you listen to, to uh, Director Murray, as important as all of those physical countermeasures that the Secret Service employs to protect the president is the preventative work that they do when they receive a threat or they hear about a threat or they find a threat on social media, they go out and engage that threat in a non uh, yeah. uh, law enforcement way, but they go out and they talk to that person that made the threat and they find out what's going on in their life and they find out whether or not they're capable of carrying out the threat. If they're just having a bad day or a bad week, if President Trump did something to incite them and they and they de-escalate the situation and they prevent it from happening and you know interestingly enough we can apply that same approach to schools and it's happening in many of uh, the the schools many districts around the country including Florida and Virginia are two examples where where behavioral threat assessment and preventative measures are in place today and they're working yeah, because it turns out the weapon, again, is secondary, tertiary, quad, whatever comes after tertiary, quadrary or whatever, to to the person who has made this life and death decision, you know, and is planning it out. And if you can interrupt that planning cycle, if you can create some kind of opportunity for them to express themselves in a different way. And, and by the way, I want to take a little bit of the load off of the mom in general, not any specific mom, but. You know, what are her resources to deal with the kid who's in crisis all the time? And it's like, I'm just trying to get my kid to from A to B every day. You're working on F. I, I can't think about F. I have no bandwidth for that. You know, I know my kid's in crisis, but, you know, what the school doesn't going kind to of reliably help them. You know, you don't want to penalize your kid for being in puberty or whatever it is, right? All these things, it is not an easy road, and it's not something that it's a society we should – we should just dismiss that there's a lot of parents. It's not in the parenting manual how to deal with this. You know, like your kid. It's you know. not. It's not. And um, and again, yeah, I don't want to point all of the blame on the mom. I was right. just, you know, in in she was an enabler of behavior, right. and she and she, what what's clear uh, in learning the history is that she did not provide any consequences. So when there was bad behavior, including some very violent behavior there were no consequences yeah. or the consequence was actually a pleasant thing, like getting more video game time. Um, right. that became, that became a self-reinforcing, uh, uh, self-reinforcing, uh, and, and, uh, the, the killer never learned that there were consequences for that behavior. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, horrible. One of the things that I know is, as an Intel guy is that we have a powerful ability and, you know, you work in tech, so you know, we have a powerful ability to, I'll say, passively scan behaviors based upon what people do on the Internet, phones, text, that kind of thing. And it's entirely possible that you can build a solution that doesn't work until you've identified somebody as having mental trouble, but you could simply listen to what they're doing. 
it terrifies us to let the government do that. And we should not trust the government because they will absolutely overstep, as we know from Edward Snowden and a bunch of other people. But they, we have these tools. Um, the other thing is, is in terms of weapons, I think we can talk smartly about if we're going to make the the RSO something other than like, hey, your friendly buddy cop down the street, you know, you can't engage in a school environment, live shooter, you can't reliably engage somebody with a pistol. It's just, it's not the right weapon for that environment. You know, like if you have to make a life to death decision, you need something different than like freeze and put your hand and like, you know, it's just, it's not right. Are we talking in terms of like tactical efficiency and, and what are your thoughts on improving the access to Intel assets to help us identify these folks more easily? Well, so I'm a big believer in prevention. So before, you know, I'll address the issue of what do we do on the day of, but right, in the right. days in the days leading up to um, that, that school resource officer should be a part of that behavioral threat assessment team. They should be part of that. They're part of that school community. Yeah. They know things that school administrators may not know. And as I think back, as I've studied these attacks um, with the help of the, re the Secret Service, I'm struggling to think of a case where the intentions of the attacker were not known by at least one other individual. I, I can't mm -hmm. think of a case where they weren't. So the first thing is, we, to your point, we can passively scan or we can ask people to, if they, if they hear something, to say something, to tell right. a responsible adult the, the, that needs to happen. And I think, I think the kids will do that. I think they can find a tr an adult they trust and they can share that information and know that, that know that the best thing for that, that, uh, their friend that they may have heard this from is to get that information that somebody can get them get them help. And that's what we need to do. So first thing we need to do is get them help. Um, what, what typically um, has been another place where these uh, attacks have um, not been stopped is that somebody knew something, but they didn't tell somebody that could do something about it. So for example, I know that um, this attacker is going to bring a gun to school, but I don't bother to tell the school resource officer, right? right. So that that can be dealt with. And so the behavioral threat assessment model, and this was pioneered, um, the University of Virginia and the Secret Service uses it. Uh, Dr. Dewey Cornell at the University of Virginia, very interesting uh, guy, by the way, just a fountain of information. Um, that information gets shared in this behavioral threat assessment team. And when that information is shared, they can make a good decision. Again, bias for action, <laughs> make a decision about what to do. And in the case of uh, let's say the Parkland killer, which they knew he'd brought weapons to school uh, and he had attacked others. There was a behavioral threat assessment process started, but it was never completed. The administrators weren't familiar with the process. They weren't, they hadn't been trained. They didn't know what to do. They didn't even know how to fill out the form to get it, to get it uh, through the process. So he was, it wasn't acted upon, but if you get that information to that team, they can make a decision and they can do something, they can act and that's prevention. And I'm, I am convinced we can stop 99.999% of these attacks if we just follow that behavioral threat assessment model. Day of, so I've, I've got uh, some experience here, although very limited, I'll be, I don't wanna overstate, but I've gone through what we call in Florida, the guardian training. So uh, I was part of uh, a, a proponent of uh, a change in the law that happened after Parkland where we established what's called a, an armed guardian program. So every school in the state of Florida has at least one armed individual on campus at all times, at least one. Sometimes those are school resource officers, law enforcement, but in many cases, smaller schools and some districts couldn't, can't, uh, can't afford a, uh, right. a full school resource officer, so they can, they can hire a guardian. Now, this guardian goes through a training regimen that's every bit as challenging as becoming a law enforcement officer. It's condensed or compressed, but you go through uh, a all kinds of training. Um, including uh, diversity training, you go through mental training, you go through prevention, you go through uh, firearms training. And the guardians in Florida pass the, the firearms training at a level higher than law, a law enforcement officer yeah. has to go it's through. It's higher so, skill in general. So higher have to skill. Deal Be because the one day, the, the, the only time they're authorized to use force, 
The only right. in, the only way a guardian can can um, exercise any law enforcement uh, um, abilities or capabilities legally is is to stop a school attack. That's right. really the only time they come into action. So, so a school guardian, um, having gone through that training myself, which it's a, it's a, over a four week program, um, it, it it's quite it's quite stringent. And one of the things we learned in there, and you'll you'll probably shake your head and laugh, but we learned about the OODA loop, right? Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so my goal. So you, you talked about you talked about you know a, an attacker with a rifle. Uh, an SRO or a guardian with a handgun, can right. they stop the attack? Well, I would, I would argue, yes, you can, because really these school attacks, when you go back and look at the planning associated with them, there was, they, they planned one path. They, they, it's not like a military campaign where they've, you know, if this happens then we'll do this. And then if this other yeah. thing happens, we'll do something. No, they don't do that. It's not that sophisticated. It's I'm going to go in and I'm going to kill as many people as I can, as quickly as I can. And I'm either going to kill myself or I'm going to, you know, have a, have a law enforcement officer kill me, or I'm going to try to get away. Very rarely do they try to get away, but some of them do. And so if you can disrupt their OODA loop, if you can get in there and disrupt their plan, they don't have a plan B. And sometimes that's as simple as, you know, uh, a, a guardian with a handgun just firing back. Um, what, what we saw in Parkland, uh, the, the shooter went up to take a perch as a sniper. He was in the teacher's lounge on the third floor. He was going to wait for students to come out into the open areas, and he was just going to he was going to act as a sniper. And he couldn't shoot through the hurricane glass in the building. Whoa. The rounds wouldn't penetrate the glass, or at least they did, but they were fragmented and they weren't, he wasn't able to hit anything. Right. And he got frustrated and he threw his firearm down and he decided he'd had enough and he, and he, and he left the uh, teacher's lounge with the other students and blended in and walked off campus. So his OODA loop got disrupted by the hurricane glass in the building. Yeah. So, so my argument uh, then is Pete that we can you can fight uh, uh, somebody with more a um, uh, higher grade of weaponry or more force than you might be able to uh, to bring as a guardian or an SRO by disrupting their plan and I think that's uh, and, and again I said there's only you know there's at least one in many cases there are multiple on campus so if you can stop an attack and wait for reinforcements or give it more time. So responding law enforcement can get there, then they can come with additional firepower. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways to, to skin this cat. I just, you know, I, I think like if I was in that situation, I'd want a carbine, you know, and I don't need to have it in a way that's like, you know, I don't know. It just, it, it is the, for my tactical experience, it's the right weapon for that job. I mean, Scott Purdy stands out of a school in Sacramento and starts shooting kids. You know, you need something to reach out and touch that person. And, you know, but, the next environment's totally different, totally different scenario. The other thing I wanted well, to- uh, de Depending on the law enforcement agencies, in, in the state of Florida, I will say many of the school resource officers have carbines. So oh, they, in addition to handguns, they, they, they have rifles. So That's good. Um, that's a good change. Yeah. And, yeah. and then when you see the response of, of the particular deputy that was there, everybody's really hard on that person. And maybe rightfully so, but I see a sheriff that has not has not built trust with his people, you know, like to stand outside and marshal things as they came in, you know, that's someone who hasn't been empowered in the right way. And it's a departmental change. And hopefully we'll see some of that too, where the departments are taking this problem in a different way. Like one of the things I always recommend in terms of, of this stuff, and I think you'll recognize like the power of this is invite parents to go out for active shooter training so they can see what's going on. Because otherwise we just live in fear and rumor and you can't do that. And as a sheriff, you damn well better let parents see like this is professional training. We're learning on the job. But yeah, it's going to be ugly a little bit. You know, like I I've talked to all kinds of people about like we go and we do the exercise. And we realize our radios don't work in the center of the school. Well, we're going to yeah. fix that, you know, and, and these are the things that but show the parents like this is how serious we take this thing. Otherwise, you know, it, it's anyhow. That's well, and that and that you're, you're absolutely 100% agree with you. You're absolutely right, and that didn't happen in Parkland. In fact, the previous sheriff who we lobbied the governor to remove and who yeah. and, and 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 that sheriff was removed um, had changed the policy from 
shall engage with an attacker to may engage. So his deputies were confused about whether or not they had an obligation to respond to a school attack. So while, while, while shots were being fired, and you can see this and hear this in the body cam footage, there are shots being fired. You have eight deputies from the Broward Sheriff's Office who did not enter that school. You can hear on their body cameras, they're putting on their armor to go in and there's shots being fired. Every single one of those shots was another life being taken at that school. And they were acting like they were waiting for the SWAT team to get there. Yeah. And that, and that's not how we respond. We learned that very clearly at Columbine. So, so those things have to change. Starts with the policy, goes to good training, uh, yeah. and clear and clear procedures. You have to know what you, uh, you have to know what you're doing, uh, and when to do it and when to act. And and uh, all of those things failed, unfortunately, in Parker. Disrupting this thing as early as possible. I mean, terrorism. You disrupt it if in you know in the recon phase. If they see you in the recon phase, you stop them and address them. They're like, Oop, not this target, another target. They're looking for something soft. So it, it is preventable in so many ways, and is likely prevented daily. But you just don't hear those stories. So definitely, if you guys uh, you know teach your kids, if they see something, say something. It's all right. It's not a bad thing to let adults get involved in these kind of crazy situations. Situations. The other thing I wanted to just real quick, like what's so obviously the schoolsafety.gov website is there. Is there another resource for parents who want to learn more and understand better, like what they can do to continue to, you know, ensure their safety of their kids and work with their community? Yeah, I'm part of a group called Stand with Parkland, standwithparkland.org. Um, and we've put some parents' resources up there. Uh, five questions you can ask your school district or ask your principal or ask your teacher or ask your school safety specialist. So these are this is an organization I'm proud to be a part of. Uh, we focus very much on helping parents understand what's going on in their schools and what they can do to make sure their kids are safe. So standwithparkland.org is a resource that I would, uh, I would point your viewers to. All right. Um, to, I'm typing up a, uh, a link right now. <laughs> okay. You were supposed to talk for 30 more seconds while I type. <laughs> okay, I can do that. Yeah. At. All right, let me finish typing this thing. All right, I'm going to put this link up here, you guys, so everybody can see it. If you're watching on the video side, if you're listening on the podcast side, I'll put the link in the show notes. You know, and I mean, it's fun to talk about the President Trump thing and, and get all crazy and, and talk about evaluating presidencies and legislators, but this is the the no fool in part that we have to get into, and and it, it, it's it's terrible for any parent that has to go through this and lose a child. And hopefully we are getting further and further into this problem so we can solve it. But you're right. It's not the means. It's getting in front of and finding that kid and taking care of them, finding that mom. That's like all I can do is get through the day and give that person, you know, as a community resources and and an out because it's not just rehab. Rehab barely works, not reliably so. It's not just sending your kid to juvie because that doesn't help your kid. You know, there's all these things that you think that's what you do, but until your kid has that problem, you know, you just don't realize how hard it is to, and maybe all you have the ability to do is just to survive. And so let's, let's understand that these, uh, these folks need help. Anything in closing at all, Matt? I mean, it's, listen, this was a great conversation and I'm so glad that you came on and did it. You know, the, again, the Trump stuff aside, but the school shooting thing, I learned a lot today and I really appreciate you doing it, man. I mean, it's, it's thank you. Ryan. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate you sharing this with your your viewers and your listeners. I hope that there are some parents out there that learn something and at least uh, uh, can look at these resources like schoolsafety.gov and standwithparkland.org, I think will be helpful to them. So I, it's been a great conversation. I appreciate it. And of course, you want to plug your business at all? Uh, no, we'll keep it. Uh, We'll, we'll keep it on the top. We'll keep it on topic today. How's that? All right, good. All right man. Well, listen, I'm going to sign off here. Hold on for one second. 